You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 307, Exodus 30 and 31. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, what's going on? Well, doing pretty well. I mean, we're in the new year. I know what I'm working on now. Right, got my writing projects, a new school. I mean, it's pretty good. You know, just this is what I like to do, turn out content. So, you know, here I here I am in Florida, able to do that every day. So I couldn't couldn't really ask for anything better. Well, can you uh, tell us about uh, your faith life, uh, Unseen Realm movies coming out, right? Well, it, yeah, the, the debut of that was January 6th, although I don't know how many people actually know about that. Um, you know, it, it might be fair to say that most people other than me would probably know the details better than I would. But I actually had to go ask. But yeah, it, it came out January 6th. Um, you know, people seem to, to like it. You know, I, you know, I, I'm glad for the response anyway. The response has, has been good. Um, I don't know when the other ones, before we, we moved, I actually filmed uh, a couple hours worth for the other two books, Angels and Demons. I think they're going to hold that until the, the demons book comes out. So they're working on something else that'll, I don't know that it'll look like unseen realm because unseen realm, we had guest scholars come in and contribute to it. I think these other ones, it'll just be me kind of like aliens and demons was, you know, just, just me, but response to unseen realm has been pretty good. So yeah, they're, they're happy. I'm happy. Well, well give us a little, uh, 10 second pitch of what the uh, documentary cover. I mean, is this going through your book basically in the video format? Yeah, the, 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 doc, the documentary will cover the sort of the the content highlights of the book. And the way we did the script, you know, I, I, I worked with Ruben, who was the director, you know, on, on, on the script. And we just, you know, more or less decided to assign uh, scholars parts of the script based upon their interest or their expertise. So it's, it's broken up pretty well, you know, in, in terms of who's contributing, but from start to finish, it works through the content at sort of a, you know, a bird's eye level, uh, the content of unseen realm. And the book's still selling unseen realm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. The book is still selling. Yep. Oh, that's good. Yep. We're four years in now and it's still selling. That's good. So it's the, the last number I actually saw was the book had sold 113,000 units, but that's that's a couple months old now. But it's yeah, it, it it still sells. I mean, that, and I when they gave me the that number, I said, well, that's a good start, you know. I <laughs> and and I meant it. I wasn't trying to be silly, but that that's a good start. So I I believe that the book, you know, hasn't penetrated lots of places where it needs to, and you know, Lord willing, it will. Well, that has to be their highest selling book of all time, surely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not even close. Yeah, it's far and away. So, you know, everybody's you know, happy with the content. And, you know, they, Lexham still wants to be my, my publisher, you know, going forward, even though I don't work there anymore. And, and I have really good reasons to, to want that as well. So, you know, that that's going to factor into sort of projects I pick. But for this year, you know, I've, I more or less knew what I needed to be working on before I moved. And, you know, they're, they're not so much a factor in 2020, but, you know, going forward, you know, that I expect, you know, Lexham certainly, again, will be in the picture there. Well, hopefully they w- will not take as long to release uh, your other book as they did Demon. <laughs> so if you could put that in one of your contract clauses, yeah, right. we would, ap- we would appreciate that. Uh, and your Demon's book is around the corner. Uh, would you remind us when that? Drops. Yeah. yeah, it's around the corner again. The end of April. Okay. End of April. Right. Yeah, I should. There should be like some time bomb in the contract. You know, like yeah. if you don't publish Seriously. it by this date, the contract dies or something. You know. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So yeah, after really. that, I mean, do you, are you writing something now that you can talk about? That's after demons. Something now that you're. Producing? Uh, no, not not you know sequentially. You know, uh, you know we were. Basically, while I was with Lexham, we were trying to to pick topics that uh, made sense in the context of Unseen Realm, you know, drill down on this or that. Um, what I'm working on now is the third novel. And, you know, I'm, 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 I've gone back to the uh, 
I don't even know what to call it, the astral prophecy thing, but, you know, which is which is not a really good way to characterize the book. But uh, essentially, it, it's about as close to, to eschatology as I'll ever get. But it's it's bent toward the use and abuse of, you know, signs in the sky, language and scripture, you know, to interpret prophecy. So I, I again, I won't go through the various circumstances that told me, yeah, I, I need to go back to that. But they were pretty clear. So that's what I'm working on. I don't know that any of it, I think some of it would relate to what would happen after Unseen Realm, like if there's an Unseen Realm 2 or an Unseen Realm 3, because I'm, it, it's getting into sacred calendar and feast days and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it, some of it may relate, but not as directly as the others. Do we have a rough time frame? I'm, I'm hoping that both of I'm hoping that both of them will be uh, shipping by the end of 2020. Right. That's my goal anyway. Uh, and, and speaking of what else is coming out at the end of this year, don't forget our cruise, Mike. So you can go to nakedbibletours.com, and in October, we're going on, you're going to be presenting for the first time your Unseen Realm 2 kind of yep. material. And so you're going to want to go on a Naked Bible cruise, and, uh, nakedbibletours.com to get more information about that. And, uh, you know, we don't want to forget that. So we got to keep reminding people about yep, that. That, need it. that will, that will be unseen realm two stuff, you know? So if you want to, you want to get that sort of content in, in a timely fashion, you know, i.e. maybe before, before you die or something <laughs> like that, <laughs> you got to sign up for the cruise. How's that for marketing Trey? You, you know, perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Take the cruise before you die. <laughs> Perfect. That's awesome. All right, Mike. Well, I guess that's the end of the year. And this year, we still got Exodus to wrap up. So we're inching closer to it. And this week, we got Exodus 30 and 31. Yep. 30 and 31. No part one. Just just Exodus 30 and 31. So, yeah, we are headed toward the end because once we hit 35 to 40 it's a lot of repetition so we we may just sort of group those chapters into one episode like kind of like we did ezekiel 40 to 48 with the uh, temple even though that one was was uh, two parts to the end of the book of ezekiel but we may end up doing the same thing here but for today uh, exodus 30 and 31 if, if you read through these chapters it's really a smattering of topics and items there's more tabernacle furniture Stuff about oil and incense, you know, then there's 31, the, the the guys who, you know, God picked to build, you know, supervise at least the tabernacle construction, so on and so forth. And again, there's just a smattering of, of different things. And since we're going to go uh, get into more tabernacle furniture, specifically the incense altar, I'm going to loop back here in the first few minutes to the bronze altar in Exodus 27, you know, because we had skipped that at the time to get into 28 and 29. So I'm going to pick that up and discuss the two altars together. Uh, I think it's just a convenient way to do it. So we'll start there, you know, with the altars. I'm going to read, go back and read Exodus 27, 1 through 8. Then I'm going to read Exodus 30, 1 through 10 about the altar of incense. So you're, you're going to see right away that there are similarities and differences here. So Exodus 27, 1 through 8, you shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long, five cubits broad. The altar shall be square. Its height shall be three cubits. And you shall make horns for it on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. You shall make pots for it to receive its ashes, shovels and basins and forks and fire pans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. You shall also make for it a grating, a network of bronze. You see a pattern here emerging. And on the net, you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. You shall set it under the ledge of the altar so that the net extends halfway down the altar. You shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. And the poles shall be put through the rings so that the poles are on the two sides of the altar. When it is carried, you shall make it hollow with boards. As it has been shown you on the mountain, so shall it be made. And when you get to Exodus 30, we get another altar. Again, you're going to see similarities here, but also differences. First 10 verses of Exodus 30, you shall make an altar on which to burn incense. You shall make it of acacia wood, just like the other one. A cubit shall be its length, a cubit its breadth. It shall be square, and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. It's also just like the other altar. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top and around its sides, and its horns. 
You shall make a molding of gold around it. You shall make two golden rings for it. Under its molding on two opposite sides of it, you shall make them, and they shall be holders for poles with which to carry it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it in the front of the veil that is above the Ark of the Testimony. In front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony where I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. A regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering. And you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. With the blood of the sin offering of the atonement, he shall make atonement for it once in the year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Now, just a few quick things that we're going to, we'll spend a few more minutes on it later. You'll notice that this atonement language at the end, you shall make atonement on its horns, and he shall make atonement for it. You know, you could, you know, again, we'll, we'll discuss how that, you know, might be rendered or understood. But this is the blood of, from the Day of Atonement offering in Leviticus 16 that is never applied to people. It's applied to things, and this is one of those things. So we need to keep that in mind as we go forward. But you see, again, you know, some obvious differences there. Now, the bronze altar, obviously made of bronze, it was the place of sacrifice since it was located, I don't know if you caught it, but outside the holy place. Again, think of the tabernacle structure. You've got, you know, this... This fence essentially surrounding rectangular fence with an opening, you know, in, in, in the front of it, one of the small sides. And then inside it, you, you have the holy place, which actually has two parts. There's a holy place and the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is. And that's the part that's covered over and closed with, you know, fabric or skin, you know, the, the, the various, you know, overlays that are described earlier in the book. Okay, so that's what we think of as the tent and, and, and also even, in some context, the tent of meeting. And it just depends where that phrase occurs. So we have the bronze altar outside of the holy place, which is part of the reason why it's bronze. Uh, it is there for sacrifice. It, it, it's, it's more distant from the presence of God. So it, it's not a gold object because the gold is reserved for the furniture items inside the holy place because they're closer to the presence of God. We've talked again about these gradations or zones of holiness and, and the, the precious metals of which things are made that are consistent with the proximity to God and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is a, a good way to illustrate the difference there. Now we know really what this looked like because, and I'm going to quote Sarna here, Quote, the altar for burnt offerings uncovered in the Judean temple at Arad in the Negev corresponds exactly to the dimensions of the altar in the tabernacle. So, you know, we've, we've got this description in Exodus 27 of the bronze altar. Well, lo and behold, one such altar was found at a different location, Arad in the Negev. That's in the, the area of land that's between the forks of Sinai. And again, the exact dimensions. It has the horns and everything. So Sarna, again, to, to quote him again, he writes this, the horn-shaped projections at the upper corners were to be carved out of the wooden structure and then bronzed so as to become integral parts of the altar. They were not to be made separately. The horns were not to be made separately and then attached to the altar. The golden altar of incense also had horns, and Ezekiel envisages a horned altar for the rebuilt temple. A Canaanite horned altar was found at Megiddo, and Israelite examples have been excavated at both Dan and Beersheba, and then, of course, Arad. All this shows that great importance was attached to the horns, a conclusion reinforced by the ritual connected with them. They were daubed with blood from the slaughtered animal sacrifices in rites of consecration and expiation. The Megiddo altar and others prove that the horned altar was not exclusively Israelite. Its origin and significance are shrouded in mystery. The horn may have been widely regarded as a symbol of strength, power, and fertility. That's the end of the Sarna quote. So before we give you some examples of the, of the horn language, again, the, the point is we know what the bronze altar looked like. The smaller incense altar is also going to have horns. We know, again, because of the bigger one, these examples that have been found, again, we know what that's going to look like. 
the horns were not supposed to be attached, but they're carved as, as part of the, the, the structure itself. And then either overlaid in the case of the one outside the holy place with bronze and the one inside with gold. So, you know, what's, what's with the horns? You know, there, there's really some interest. I mean, this is language that shows up a lot in the Old Testament. And it really has a number of different contexts. Now, Sarna said it, horns are probably, you know, widely regarded as a symbol of strength, power, and fertility. I'm just going to read you a few, you know, random passages. This is 1 Samuel 2.10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So his anointed and king are parallel there. So strength and horn, exalting the horn are parallel. What does that mean? Well, again, that's Sarnas' point. It's kind of difficult to know. It might have something to do with power, either physically or politically, or in terms of authority. It might have something to do with virility, you know, because the, the, the kingship's going to be passed, you know, dynastically. I mean, scholars have to sort of guess in a number of these, these passages. Here's Second Samuel 22, 3. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. So God is the horn of his salvation, David's salvation. Well, what, what, what is that? Can God would be the source of deliverance, the source of power that affects the deliverance. Again, you, you have to sort of not massage it, you know, in, in terms of like, you know, producing uh, in a false sense uh, an interpretation, but sort of try to discern what would be, again, the cause and effect relationship here and, and, and associate the language of the horn with that. Ezekiel 29, 21, on that day, I will cause a horn to spring up for the house of Israel. And I will open your lips among them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Now, this is Ezekiel 29. Again, we know the context of that. You know, Jerusalem's going to get judged and so on and so forth. So sometimes you get this horn language for a deliverer, maybe a dynastic promise of a di David's dynasty surviving. Again, it, it, it's kind of obscure. Amos 6.13, you who rejoice in lo debar and who say, have we not by our own strength captured Karnaim for ourselves. Again, this Karnaim is related to, in, in terms of, of Hebrew, it's related to the term for horns because it's spelled the same way, or excuse me, it's spelled the same way. Karnaim actually means horns. So have we not by our own strength captured the, the place of the horns or something like that for ourselves? Again, it's, this would be a, maybe a citadel or a, a city or Again, this 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 place that you know had to be conquered. It, it was a fortress or fortified in some way. So you get the idea. You know, the the opposite you also get. The lopping off of the horns is you know weakness. It's negative. So Jeremiah forty eight twenty five. The horn of Moab is cut off, and his arm is broken. Declares the Lord. Now the arm we know is a symbol, like you know in Exodus, like Pharaoh's arm or the arm of the Lord. It's a symbol of strength. Well, here, the horn of Moab and, and the arm of Moab are, are synonymous. So again, it might have something to do with some sort of power in the abstract. Psalm 75, 11, all the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. What does that mean? Does it mean descendants? Does it mean soldiers? You know, what children? I mean, again, it, it's, it's hard to determine exactly, but it has a sort of a broad metaphorical semantic range that, again, Sarna sum, uh, summarized by symbol of strength, power, fertility, so on and so forth. The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, I think, is helpful here, too. In general, it, it, it says, the entry says, on, this is the entry on horns, horn represents power or status in a social context. In Deuteronomy 33, 17, Moses compares the tribes of Joseph to, quote, a firstborn bull whose horns are the horns of a wild ox, unquote, because Ephraim and Manasseh were large and powerful. They were large and powerful tribes. So again, you get this metaphor. Therefore, the entry continues, lifting up the horn of someone means bestowing power, joy, health, prestige, and a variety of things. Psalm 92.10 is cited here. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. Conversely, the entry continues, cutting off the horn is the removal of one's power or influence. 
Since God is the source of strength to those who trust in him, David declares, quote, the Lord is the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, Psalm 18, 2. In Revelation 5, 6, this is New Testament, the lamb has seven horns. His kingly power is perfect, again, seven, the number of completeness. By metonymy, the entry goes on, horn came to symbolize those who had power, either politically or military. Now, on a sidebar here, metonymy is the, is, it's a literary, it's a term for the, the literary substitution of an attribute or object for the thing that the attribute or object represents. Modern example would be using a term like suits for business executives. Oh, the suits are coming over today. Well, Again, you're referring to these business executives, but you're using this, in this case, an object that's associated with them to stand in the place of them. It's just a way of of referring to the same, to the thing referred to with the, you know, some sort of attribute or adjectival way of doing it. Metonymy is the term for that. The entry goes on, in Mesopotamian art, horns indicate deity and deified kings from Naram Sin. Onward. Thus, in Daniel 7 and 8, the horns represent successions of kings or multiple branches of military power. The book of Revelation picks up this kind of imagery. Both the dragon and the first beast in Revelation 12, 13 have 10 horns, which Revelation 17, 12 explains as 10 kings. In Zechariah 1, 18 through 21, the metaphor is taken both ways. The horns represent both the foreign powers themselves, Zechariah 1, 18, and the condition of their strength and influence, Zechariah 1.21. Since horn is a symbol of power, particularly kingly power, it is not unnatural that it represent God's anointed one, the Messiah. Psalm 148.14 and Ezekiel 29.21 possibly use horn as a metonym for the expected Messiah. Uh, Psalm 148.14, he has raised up a horn for his people, praise for all his saints. For the people of Israel who are near him, praise the Lord. This is a psalm of ascent, going back up up the hill to Zion after the exile. And of course, we already read Ezekiel 29, 21. Horns also became a symbol for radiance. This is interesting. Psalm 132, 17 parallels horn and lamp. I will make a horn sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. That's the RSV. So David and the anointed are parallel, horn and lamp are parallel. Thus the Hebrew verb karan, which may have originally been a verbal form of karen, the word for horn, uh, in Exodus 34, 29 and 30, probably means to shine. Karan there means to shine. And this is the source of the medieval idea that Moses had horns. Let me read you the passage. Exodus 34, I mean, we'll get to this eventually anyway. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Now, if you actually look at the verb there, shone or to shine, it's karan, which is the verbal counterpart to the noun karen, which means horn. So again, as, as the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery is pointing out, this is the confusion of, of some in the Middle Ages over this verb, uh, you know, because it's, it's pretty unusual, or this form used as a verb. You know, they didn't know what to do with it because they knew the noun meant horns, so like, what in the world is that? And so you'll actually have art, art that has Moses bearing horns. He has horns on his head. You know, and this is, this is, again, the passage it comes from but it's created by a a linguistic confusion. Back to the entry. The sacrificial altar, similar to other ancient Near Eastern altars, had four horns, which were projections on the four corners of the top, on which blood was smeared. The altar of incense also had four horns. The horns of an altar, whatever their original purpose, probably came to symbolize the power of that altar. Just as the cutting off of Moab's horns was a destruction of Moab's power, so the cutting off of the horns of the altars at Bethel symbolized the destruction of their religious or cultic power. So Amos 3.14 says this, 
On the day I punish Israel for his transgressions, I will punish the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. So they actually, you know, there, there were actually occasions when, you know, Israelites or, you know, some other people, depending on what, what battle or what, what, thing, what event we're talking about here, would go in and they would hack off the horns of the sacrificial altars. Again, that was a way of signifying that this this altar, this basically they're they're profaning sacred space, and and this altar has no more effectual power to do whatever it is you people thought was happening here at the altar. Your God has been defeated. We are taking over his sacred space. Okay, it's it's just this idea. So even the horns on the altar were a symbol of the of the again effectiveness, effectuality. Uh, of what happens ritually at this place. So that, this is why the altar uh, or altars have horns. Again, it's just this, it's this, uh, you know, symbolic metaphorical idea of its, you know, it, its effectiveness, its power, you know, the, it, the ability, you know, again, to you know, the, the reality and the ability of what's happening here at this place is sort of visually reinforced by the horns on the altar. That's the idea. Now, the altar of incense in Exodus 30, you know, we're, we're done with dictionary biblical imagery now, was made of gold, not bronze. Again, we pointed that out earlier because it's in closer proximity to the presence of God. It's in the holy place in front of the veil that is above the Ark of the Testimony, to quote verse 6 in Exodus 30. And that sort of segues into you know, some an interesting discussion or a question, like what's up with incense? Because here you have the altar of incense right in front of the veil behind which is the ark. And that actually gives you sort of a clue as to what the incense was doing or, or how it was thought of, you know, what 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 imagery there, what what what's going on with it. It's not just the smell, even though the smell of the incense actually does play a role here. It does have importance. But visually it also has you know, some significance. So Sarna, again, summarizes this, I think, pretty nicely. He writes, The use of incense in rites of worship was widespread and had a long history in the ancient world. It is surprising, therefore, that the instruction to build an altar for the ritual burning of incense in the tabernacle is not included in the main pericope, that is, the, the main section of instructions for the tabernacle here. We're only getting to it in chapter 30. A possible answer is that although incense is foretokened in Exodus 25, verse 6, it plays no role in the installation ceremonies of the priesthood, which just happened a couple chapters earlier, you know, 28, 29, chapter 29. Hence, notice of its use is deferred until those directives are completed. Let me just break in here again. So his point is that once we, once we get a priesthood consecrated, then it's it makes more sense to talk about the incense as one of their duties. But that's all he's saying here. As to the reason for omitting the incense offering from the rituals, that the consecration rituals themselves, the symbolism that attached to it made it inappropriate to the occasion. There are grounds for believing. Now, here's, here's the part I want to catch your attention with. There are grounds for believing that the cloud of aromatic incense in the tabernacle and later in the temple was perceived to be emblematic or a reminder of God's invisible active presence, just as was the cloud that accompanied the Israelites at the exodus from Egypt in the course of the wanderings in the wilderness, as noted in or earlier in Exodus. He, he quotes Exodus 13. The ritual for the Day of Atonement requires that the high priest, quote, shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, so that the cloud from the incense screens the cover that is over the ark. That's Leviticus 16.13. It is explained that God appears, quote, in the cloud over the cover, Leviticus 16.2. So if you look, go back to Leviticus 16, you have this description of the incense cloud that is over the ark. It screens the cover that's over the ark. But, but you know, in the same chapter, you have this note that God appears in the cloud. What, what, what cloud? See, we, we kind of would think it's the cloud that's been they've been you know following or it's been leading them in the wilderness. But but what Sarna's point is that in context it's it's actually the, the cloud of that that forms when they're burning the incense. 
that's where the Lord's going to appear because the ark is right behind that veil. Okay, so you know, it, it, again, it's a visual emblematic display of God's presence. Thus, the cloud of incense, this is back to Sarna, screens the high priest from the divine presence, even as it serves as a constant reminder of the divine presence. The cloud of glory is said to descend on the tabernacle and to suffuse it only after the structure is entirely completed and only at the end of the seven days of ceremony. So that phenomenon expresses divine satisfaction and acceptance of the shrine, and, and it signifies its divine le legitimation as the house of worship. Therefore, hence, it would have been premature to produce the cloud of incense at the installation of the priesthood. So Sarna's point is that they have to do this stuff first. They have to consecrate the priest first, consecrate the house, and then when God accepts it, the, the glory cloud, the actual glory cloud, you know, descends as a symbol of acceptance. And then afterwards, you can mimic or mime the cloud, the glory cloud, through the cloud of the altar, you know, at the altar of incense when you burn the incense. Then it be, then it makes sense to do that because God has previously, uh, after the sanctification ceremonies, He has He has accepted what was done in building the tabernacle and all the furnishings and, and everything else. So that, again, that's Sarna's commentary as to, you know, why we get the description here and, and what, it, what it very likely means. Now, Maimonides, this is back to Sarna. And Maimonides was a Jewish philosopher and a theologian and actually a physician by training. He lived in the 12th century, 1135 to 1204. Uh, Maimonides maintains that the use of incense was originally instituted to ameliorate and sweeten the stench of the burning flesh of the sacrifices. While this may be so, and I'm, I'm sure it had that impact, there's no doubt that it became an independent ritual in its own right with its own significance and mystique. Uh, again, so he, he throws in Maimonides, because, and I threw it in, because you probably have heard this. Well, the incense was about just this so that the place doesn't stink. You know, either the awful of an offering getting disposed of properly or the burning of the flesh or, you know, whatever. Well, okay, you know, it, 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 it probably had that effect. Whether that was really its role or not is, is doubtful. And I would say, again, especially because of what Leviticus 16 says, is it associates the presence not only, you know, with the glory cloud descending, but, but the Lord will appear in the cloud, you know, right there at the veil, you know, at, the, at the altar of incense. So, Again, I think it, it, it's more significant that the altar of incense was there to, again, recreate the visual memory of God's presence in a cloud in the wilderness. That, that was more of its role. Again, I, I think there's still something else as well uh, to this. Uh, we'll, we'll get to it in a, in a moment here. Um, one other thing, th and this is a source that's accessible on the web. Uh, this is a Mormon journal. So, you know, with that caveat, it's Studia Antiqua. But again, this, th this is a very interesting article. It's by James Carroll and Elizabeth Seiler. Let my prayer be set before thee, the burning of incense in the temple cult uh, of ancient Israel. And again, if you're listening for the first time, cult refers to a ritual system, not like Jim Jones or something. Uh, so, this is an article actually on the practice of burning incense you know, in ancient Israel. And part of the article says this, the offering of sacrifice and the burning of incense are the two most attested forms of worship in the ancient Near East. Incense was used in secular settings to combat normal everyday odors. Okay, so they're like, yep, generally, you know, you can, you can say that. Going on, from its more practical uses, incense gained abstract significance once it entered the temple cults. For example, and, and the, the authors here are quoting another source, uh, Kjeld Nielsen, uh, who wrote a book called Incense in Ancient Israel in 1986. Uh, once it entered the temple cults, the Egyptians, uh, you know, it, it just took on a more abstract significance. So, for example, to the Egyptians, incense had a purifying power, cleansing the air both literally and ritually. So not only smelled better, but it was also a, a, a ritually significant difference. It, what I'm getting to here is that, is that incense also played a role in marking out sacred space. In other words, because they're burning incense in sacred space, that space will smell different than any other space. So you could go throughout your day and you know, you're, you're smelling the normal smells of life, but when you smell this, Again, the incense, you know that you are near or perhaps on or at a sacred spot. That was one of its roles. And the, again, the, 
in in Egyptology, this is this is quite clear in terms of Egyptian religion. But what they're going to do is they're going to bring it over into other parts of the world, including the Bible, and say, you know, basically we got, we got the same kind of thing working here. So the Egyptians, back to the to the to the article, they considered the smoke of the incense as sort of a stairway connecting the earthly abode with that of the heavenly, again marking out sacred space. Thus, to the Egyptian, incense provided both a means of ascent and communication. The use of incense was also common throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Although there are no ritual texts from Arabia to explain the details of their use of incense, several altars have been found in Arabia with the names of various aromata described upon them. Let me just break in here. What they mean there is there's actually going to be inscriptions of, you know, of, of the, the terms for what the incense was made of actually inscribed uh, on the altars. Back to the article. Furthermore, incense was commonly imported from Arabia into Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Palestine. Incense was also common in ancient Canaan. The biblical text is replete with descriptions of the use of incense by the Canaanites and the Israelites who were swayed by Canaanite religious practices. The Bible describes the burning of incense by the Canaanites both upon sacred high places and in sacred groves. Although we have the names of the substances preserved in our records, for example, Exodus 30, 20 through 38, and I'm not going to read all that in this episode, but there you get a list of the names from which the incense was made. Although we have the names, the actual knowledge of what these ingredients are has been lost, at least largely lost. Many different and often contradictory hypotheses have been set forth as to the identity of the ingredients of the cultic incense. Unfortunately, there have been very little research, there has been very little research comparing the strengths and weaknesses of the various hypotheses. The you know, end of the quotation, actually, you know, if I can break in here, that this would actually be, for those of you prospective graduate students out there, this actually is a decent uh, dissertation topic because I'm betting, okay, I'm betting that the ingredients of Israelite incense were different, at least a little bit, discernibly different than what the Canaanites were doing or anybody else. Because again, it would, it would mark a particular sacred space. So the ingredients were actually important. And, we, and we, you know, we've already mentioned uh, it, both in other episodes and in this one real briefly that you, you couldn't burn unauthorized incense on the altar of incense in the holy place. Well, one of the reasons is, is again, the distinctiveness of it. Again, we're not doing what the pagans do, okay? We're, so even down to their incense, the, the, the way it smells, what they use in it, you know, their brand, so to speak, even that, again, needs to be different. There's authorized and then there's unauthorized, okay? It reinforces the same points. So, but the, more, the simpler point here is that particular incense was only allowed to be burned on the altar of incense. Exodus 30, verse 9, again, says that you shall not offer unauthorized incense on it. Or a burn offering or grain offering, you shall not pour a drink offering on it. It's used for one thing. It's used for burning incense and one kind of incense, you know, that, that which has been selected and sanctified. So you know, they're doing this to mark sacred space as distinct from common space and also to mark this sacred space as distinct from other spaces held sacred by those who worship other gods. So again, when, when you were near this and you smelled it, this is not an ordinary location. When you smelled it, you knew you were on or near holy ground. That, that it was, it was a big part of what's going on here. It's not just a deodorizer, you know, like Maimonides was saying, and I'm sure, again, some of you have heard. Yeah, it, it, it had that effect for sure, but it really has two fundamental purposes. Marking off sacred space and then to, to mime or mimic the, the, the cloud in which God, the presence of God is, that, that visual reminder to the priests. So let's move on to Exodus 30, verses 11 through 16. This is the census tax. Again, this is kind of an odd, you know, sort of little passage here. It says, in verse, starting in verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel 
when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting. And that's the tented structure that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. Again, this is a one-time collection for the construction and maintenance of the tabernacle, which kind of explains why these verses are found here, because we're getting on the tail end of constructing the thing. We're, we're, we're basically, we're leading up to the point where God's going to mark off the, the, the men who are going to do the construction. So the census tax thing, you know, pericope is right here. In verses 12 and 16 that we just read, make it clear that this is not only a contribution to the construction and maintenance of the tabernacle, but there's also another aspect to consider. And I'm going to quote Carpenter here, his Exodus commentary. He writes, for some reason, each Israelite who is enrolled in this census must pay atonement money. The Hebrew term is kofair for his life. The ordinance recalls the redemption of the firstborn. That was way back in Exodus 13 and thus would have reminded the people of Yahweh's ownership of and redemption of the nation. The atonement money is for expiation or propitiation, or simply money given to prevent the wrath of Yahweh because someone did not contribute his fair share of support for the construction and service of the tabernacle. Even in the latter case, expiation or propitiation could be part of the picture, for the payment of the money averts the wrath of God from those enrolled. It prevents rather than removes their guilt or Yahweh's wrath. The rich are not required to give more, nor is the poor man allowed to give less as a contribution offering, for it is Yahweh who freely gives atonement. He seeks no monetary gain, but demonstrates who he is. Each Israelite shares equally in the construction and care of the tabernacle, and no one Israelite is of more value than another. The rich cannot obtain a greater share of Yahweh's presence with their riches. And the poor are not excluded because they have only the minimum. Now, my two cents worth here as, as follow-up. In other words, the people are contributing to the system. To the, they're, they're, they're contributing to this, this structural object that will be integral and indispensable to the system of ritual that will protect them from harm that might result from violating sacred space or touching something that has been dedicated to the Lord's exclusive use by means of the priesthood. So in that sense, the payment acts as an exchange to circumvent that rather unfortunate circumstance. So I would understand the atone language in that light, because the tabernacle is going to be built, and you people will have a means to worship the Lord. Okay, we're building this thing. You're going to have a means to worship the Lord who saved your lives from Egypt. And you ought to be grateful for that. But as well, when we do this, when we build this thing, you won't blunder, okay, and, you know, by, by defiling sacred space intentionally. Or, I mean, the, the whole system is going to help you approach the Lord and, and, again, all that sort of stuff so that you don't forfeit your lives by violating God's presence. You're essentially paying not only for the institution or the, or the, or the object, again, the, the tabernacle, but you're also in some sense paying homage to the Lord who will remember his covenant with you. Remember that you are his people. And this is also done, again, for your protection so that you don't, you don't do something that violates his sanctity to elicit his wrath. Again, there, there's, there's a certain logic to it. That if you if you think of them as contributing to a, a you know the whole ritual system the whole you know cult to use that that terminology that academic terminology associated with the tabernacle then again we can get I think a better sense of why they're doing this it's not just for construction and maintenance it goes a little bit beyond that uh, in terms of of you know the having those 20 years old and upward each and every person contribute something and the same thing. Again, the rich don't get, get any more protection here. Everybody contributes the same thing, both to build the thing, to maintain it, to pay homage to the Lord, and also you're paying for the, the system or the means of worship and self-protection. <laughs> so again, it, it makes sense on, on, on terms like that, you know, if we can think of it like that. 
The next section is the bronze basin. This is Exodus 30, 17 through 21. Again, there, I'll just read that briefly. You shall make, the Lord said to Moses, you shall make a brace, basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You'll, you shall put it in between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, again, this is the holy place, or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. Well, that would be good. <laughs> verse 21. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It's repeated. So it might be important if it's repeated. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offering throughout their generations. Now Sarna again summarizes the, the, the point of the object this way. He says, this vessel was not included in the earlier instructions for several reasons. One, the use to which it was put was not an act of divine worship, but was preparatory to it. Two, it was not needed for the installation ceremony because that required immersion of the entire body, whereas the laver was solely for washing the hands and the feet. And three, it was not fashioned with materials provided by the public donations, but from the bronze mirrors of the women who served at the entrance of the tabernacle. And there's the verse reference for that is Exodus 38.8. For practical reasons, the laver was placed between the entrance of the tabernacle and the altar of sacrifice so that the priest enter the sanctuary in a state of ritual purity and bodily cleanliness. Its importance may be weighed by its inclusion among the vessels that were consecrated by being anointed with oil. In verse 28, we find it's anointed with oil. The dimensions of the labor are not given. According to verse 20, the washing is an indispensable requirement. Its neglect renders the priest's service uh, invalid and also puts him in harm's way as well. So again, the, the, the bronze basin is kind of self-explanatory. If you remember back when we talked about the plagues, some of the plagues affected the Egyptian priests, gave them lice, for instance. So that, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a common idea that you had to be, in terms of, of your, your bodily self, you had to be whole, can have a, a physical defect. You had to be clean. You had to be disease-free. Of course, in their case, you had to be lice-free. Okay, you know, in other words, you you had to be whole and complete and clean to to do ministry to a deity in, in the sense of the Egyptian priest. Well, it's the same idea here. Um, you know, they had to wear a certain thing, and that we talked about the priest's garments uh, in the previous episode. And you had to be clean here. This is the purpose of the basin. So it's kind of self-explanatory. There's no real sort of theological or mystical you know idea other than the notion of cleanliness like you're not again to, to use this metaphorically you're not defiled in terms of you're not dirtied up by the world you don't have the dirt of common space on you when you go into the holy place when you enter sacred space you know, it's just that sort of conceptual idea exodus 31 let's skip there because the 22 through the end there of 38 is just the is the ingredients for the incense you get into Exodus 31, you get the personnel. And this is, uh, let me just read the first few verses here. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hor, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat, so on and so forth. He goes through the whole list of the things that have been described earlier. Uh, this is what they're supposed to do. So he, God picks these men out. Now, the one thing I want to note here in relation to this section is verse 3. I have filled him with the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God, this is the Ruach Elohim. This is the same term used that we find in Genesis 1-2, okay, to describe the Spirit of God hovering you know, over the face of the deep. So again, uh, Sarna and others, I believe this is from Sarna, he points out, he says this, it is possible to argue that this phrase refers to an excellent spirit or divine spirit. There's something like that. Again, I'm, I'm just summarizing. I'm paraphrasing the content here. So it's possible to say it refers to that. Like Ruach Elohim doesn't mean like the capital S Spirit of God. That's possible. 
could just mean an excellent spirit or even a divine spirit. Like like to point out that 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 they have divine help, uh, you know, in, in some way. But given its use in context, though, it most likely refers to capital G, you know, the spirit, God's spirit. Because if you look at Exodus 28, 3, you shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. So this whole idea of skillfulness and spirit of skill, spirit of skill there is the Ruach Chokmah. So if since that terminology is used there, but the Ruach Elohim is used here in Exodus 31, I think chances are good that we actually mean the Spirit of God here, else they would have used the, you know, the, the writer would have used the earlier terminology to, to convey that concept. Of, they were just good at their jobs and they had, they had God's help. You know? Um, you know, the Spirit of God likewise gives Joseph and Daniel wisdom to perform their functions, Genesis 41, 38, Daniel 4, 8. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to argue away from God's personal activity and interest in what's going on here is the point. So I think, I think the phraseology, you can, you can use that to make a good argument that, that they were empowered by the spirit of God and that this isn't just a generic reference to skillfulness or some sort of more abstract divine help. Now I'll admit that Passages like Genesis 41:38. Okay, Pharaoh said to his servants, and this he's talking about Joseph after Joseph interprets his dream. Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? And then Daniel 4, 8. Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and in whom is the Spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, so on and so forth. Now, I'll admit both of those instances are in the mouth of pagans. One is a Pharaoh, the other one's Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, I, I get that. But you actually don't really need those sorts of parallels. You know, if, if you look at Exodus 28.3, this is where, again, the, the divine enablement idea is most clear. There's no useful reason or clear way to distinguish you know, all that stuff in, in such a way where we, we rule out that this is the Holy Spirit. So, that, again, that, that's my take on Exodus 31.3. I think, I think it is describing the Holy Spirit specifically, directly. Uh, enabling these men to do their job. Now, part of the reason I also say that is because the, the Old Testament theology of the Holy Spirit, I don't want to go down this rabbit trail too far because it could be a whole episode, but it, it, generally speaking, you don't have permanent or, or even sustained indwelling language of the Holy Spirit in people, in believers in the Old Testament. What you get is you get the Holy Spirit coming, you get these phrases like coming upon, enabling, resting upon, rushing upon, okay? This kind of language, you get the Holy Spirit doing that with individual people specifically for a service or a task. You get it with judges, you get it with kings, you get it with prophets. Okay, there, there's there's no like sweeping, all-encompassing statements. In other words, there has to be something new about the new covenant. The new covenant, you get that language where the Spirit of God is is coming upon, you know, all believers, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, you, it, it's, it's more all-encompassing. It's more sweeping. Uh, it, it, it's spoken of in ways that are supposed to be enduring, okay? But you don't really get that uh, in the Old Testament. And so I think this is part of that sort of matrix of ideas, again, that, that, that theology of the Holy Spirit. I think we have Exodus 31 here as being part of that, you know, way that the, that the Spirit of God functioned administered in the Old Testament. And lastly, here we have the exurbance of the Sabbath, Exodus 31, 12 through 18. So, you know, again, this shouldn't be any surprise, especially given, you know, earlier episodes uh, or, you know, of the podcast where we talked about the relationship between the Sabbath elements and the tabernacle instructions. You know, we've already talked about how when, when you read through the tabernacle instructions, you get this inclusion of Sabbath elements from Genesis. You know, we've seen how that's a literary and a theological device to connect the tabernacle to the creator and creation. So that the fact that when we're all done with all this, all the instructions, all the people who are going to work on it, all, you know, the, all the tasks are laid out that we observe the Sabbath. I mean, that, that again, would make sense. And we've actually hit this earlier, you know, in, in, in previous episodes when we talked about this pattern. So Sarna adds, and we'll conclude with this. 
he writes the concluding and appropriately the seventh literary unit within the pericope of the instructions for the tabernacle is devoted to the observance of the law of the Sabbath. Correspondingly, the resumption of the tabernacle narrative in chapter 35 commences, it begins with the Sabbath law. This structural pattern is intended to make an emphatic statement about the hierarchy of values that informs the Torah. That is, the tabernacle enshrines the concept of the holiness of space, but the Sabbath embodies the concept of the holiness of time. The latter takes precedence over the former, and the work of the tabernacle must yield each week to the Sabbath rest. So it's subordinate that even the tabernacle, the sacred space on earth, is subordinate to the pattern that the Creator laid out. You know, is, is is Sarna's point. And again, we've talked about this patterning of Sabbath and tabernacle, and where the Sabbath instructions get inserted, and how that frames the whole uh, the, the whole narrative account, the set of instructions. Again, we're right right here we are. You know, the seventh literary unit. This is how it concludes. You know, with the Sabbath. So the pattern is consistent. Again, we've talked about that before and you know it shouldn't be a, a surprise now what it what it does though interestingly enough you know what what's the next chapter it's chapter 32 it's the golden calf <laughs> it's just you know it, it's 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 where all of this is violated okay it's all violated so again that is intentional as well uh again the reader would have would have no doubt been you know humming along here Tabernacle instructions, creator creation, you know, you know, order out of chaos. All this is wonderful. We've been delivered from Egypt, you know, blah, blah. blah. And then we hit the golden calf. So, again, its placement is also intended, you know, to jar the reader. But we'll talk about that on the next episode when we continue with Exodus. All right, Mike, sounds good. Getting there, almost there. And don't forget, we're going to be taking questions specifically about Exodus. So I've been gathering up, Mike, a bunch of questions about Exodus. So if you have any questions specifically targeting anything that we've covered over Exodus, send them to me at tracestrickland at gmail.com. And then we'll have uh, a Q&A, maybe one or two episodes. And then after, yep, that, we got a, after that, we got some interviews and we're going to start something new. And uh, and again, Mike, I think yep, uh, yep. at the time of this airing, it's exactly our fifth year anniversary. So again, uh, happy anniversary. Uh, Do you, like, you really know that? You really know the date? Yeah, it's like, uh, Man, it's like that's January. Amazing. <laughs> it's uh, January, uh, I want to say 20th or something. I'm not quite sure. I mean, we could look it up. It's, it's when I posted the uh, podcast, right? I mean, yeah, uh, you, yeah you should look it up because I, I, I mean, I can do simple math. But as far as the date, man, you got me there. <laughs> yeah, uh, January 21st is when I uh, started posting stuff. So, all right, yeah. Well, with that, Mike, yeah. So, happy anniversary. Uh, I hope you got me a diamond yeah. ring or Happy something. anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Some> diamond <laughs> or earrings or, a, or, you know. If yeah, I wore a gold earrings. watch or something like yeah. that, yeah. Hey, yeah. for our 10th one, if we're still alive for 10, you know, we need to do something like that get watches or something i'll get you like i'll get you like a gold a gold fidget spinner or something like that how's that (laughs) i got a black and red one right here can you hear it right can you hear it spinning (laughs) Spinning. not now i can't yeah well i got you Uh, a gift too so the next time i see you in person i need to give give you a gift i did get you something small and it's a serious gift you'll like it it's it's worthy it's a worthy gift so next time i see you i'll get you a gift for our 300th episode all right All right, well, we'll have to to put some thought into that. (laughs) (laughs) All right, sounds good, Mike. Well, we're looking forward to it next week, and uh, just want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 